Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad you have chosen to come to the Kelso Lecture, an annual conversation on race and faith at Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. My name is Dave Swanson. I am pastor at Pittsburgh Mennonite Church and chair of the Spiritual Leaders Caucus of the Pennsylvania Interfaith Impact Network, which organizes people of faith for justice here in Pittsburgh. I wish I were there with you in person, but alas, COVID had other plans. In early 2015, we had reached the tail end of a terrible six month period marked by the killings of Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, and other young black men across America at the hands of police. The public nature of these deaths called for a response. And a conviction arose among myself, Pastor Robert Tedder of Union Baptist Church of Swiss Vale, an African American congregation, and Helen Blyer here at the seminary that solidarity must replace silence. In the face of racial violence, the white church could no longer afford to remain segregated from the black church or in denial of the racialized forces shaping the world we inhabit. In the subsequent years, I've come to see that even saying race and faith together is to mark new ground in theological institutions like this one and the churches they influence. To acknowledge racism and the racially built world in seminary and church is not only to hold that racial realities should be engaged theologically, but also that theological realities as instantiated in churchly institutions and communities can and must be explored as happening within the dynamics of racial segregation and oppression. This to say the least, is a disruptive and risky proposition for institutions unused to such examination. But living discourse happens in courageous spaces. I think the fact that this institution has continued to invest its resources in this event is a beautiful sign that it is willing to practice the courage and humility necessary for faithfulness in the world we live in. My great hope is that these conversations can be a declaration that the life of the world matters, bodies in social space matter, that people matter. My great hope is that each of us here and all of us together will encounter a transformative gospel message, that the liberative movement of Jesus shall not be confined to ivory towers or segregated church spaces, but draws sundered peoples together. My great hope is that we will respond to the challenge to live into the good news that the dividing wall has been torn down and that Christ has invited us into a new reality of risky and hopeful joining and spirit infused solidarity. So again, I welcome you and ask that you listen with me for the spirit of life as she beckons to us, drawing us out of our dullness and into the light of a new day. My friend Dave has already given us a compelling set of reasons why those of us who are people of faith should care deeply about issues of race and racial division. I would like to begin by invoking the same words that Jesus invoked when he began his public ministry, according to the Gospel of Luke. Quoting the prophet Isaiah, he said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This, just after he was tempted in the desert with access to all of the locations of power. The flipped logic of God's preferred future cuts the powers and principalities off at the knees. And friends, we know how the story is supposed to end. I'm so grateful that my friend and colleague, Dr. Dennis Edwards, is here to speak into this good work. He has spent his professional life as a minister talking about these very questions, interrogating them, lifting them up, exploring them in communities. How do people of faith claim power and proclaim freedom from the margins, those locations that are furthest from the center? How do we create communities of substantive, justice-bearing relationships? 
What does it mean for people of faith to end generational cycles of racial injustice and hew more closely to the year of the Lord's favor? Having served and having planted congregations in New York, the Twin Cities, and the District of Columbia, Dr. Edwards has also honed his craft as a New Testament scholar. His most recent book, which I might add makes a terrific read for church groups, adult ed sessions, and other book clubs, note that, um, is called Might from the Margins, The Gospel's Power to Turn the Tables on Injustice. In it, he provides a depth exploration of what interpretation on the right-hand side of the Bible looks like from the location of the racially discriminated. He currently serves as Associate Professor of New Testament at North Park Theological Seminary and is ordained in the Evangelical Covenant Order. It's a privilege and a delight both to bring him here to PTS to invite us more fully into this work. Dennis, welcome. Thank you so much. It really is a privilege to be with you all. I am, I'm, I'm honored. It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood here at um, Pittsburgh Theological. You knew it was coming, <laughs> and I, I enjoyed um, my time uh, with several of you over dinner, and um, and appreciate uh, Helen a great deal. We met years ago and got to be in Israel on a trip together. Um, so it's, it's a it's a privilege and also fun to be here, even though the topic is uh, a challenging one. Well, I'm going to dive right in, and hopefully you'll have some questions at the end. I'm talking on three of the points that are in the book, so um, it won't be exhaustive, but hopefully enough of a taste of what I was trying to get at in writing the book. One of the reasons I wrote My From the Margins is to acknowledge how powerful people and structures silence or at least minimize the voices of certain people. And the goal of such marginalization is to preserve dominance. Yet dominance over our fellow human beings is not the way of Jesus, of course. And despite the corrupt and even toxic forms of Christianity that have revealed themselves throughout history, what we know of Jesus through scripture, perhaps also through personal faith, is that the kingdom of God is not like earthly kingdoms, domination, marginalization, segregation, discrimination, dehumanization. These are not the ways of the kingdom, and Jesus' followers ought not be champions of injustice, yet there appears to be an ongoing need to affirm and constantly reaffirm that the Christian church is meant to honor Jesus in the world and not do all we can to embarrass him. I, um, I, I have made attempts at humor from time to time in my life. Um, my kids don't think I'm funny, though. <laughs> so... I come today as a student of the Bible and also as a pastor who's tried for over three decades to be a helpful presence in the world, learning from my mistakes and listening to those who have been beaten down by the vicissitudes of life. So there's a long list of things that I am not, as well as things that I'm not good at, but one thing I try to be is honest. So I come today with an honest look at scripture and experience with the hopes of encouraging all of us to not give up on being agents of peace, love, and justice in the world. And I was going to tell here a personal story because I have so many and the older I get, of course, you know, we have a lot of stories to tell. But I'm not, I'm not going to um, because I don't want my story to be the most important thing. But I'm going to point you to um, something that uh, was written by a young scholar friend of mine. He's getting a lot of press now. And if you can get him to come out here, his name is Esau McCauley. All right, that was my book, shameless plug. But that's, I had mentioned it already. But Esau has an, has an essay in The Atlantic. America isn't ready to truly understand the Buffalo shooting. And he, he talks, he, he makes a great connection between what happened in Buffalo and too many other places with that connection there with this nation's underlying disregard and sometimes downright hatred of people of color. Um, Esau has a book, he probably doesn't even know I'm plugging him, he has a book called Reading While Black. It's a book, as you might know, it's, um, on, it's hermeneutics. 
I, I, I gave it an endorsement, so my name's on the back. <laughs> but anyway, I really do appreciate it. I mean, the book really took off. He's a great writer. And he's making the connection that we need to make, that what we saw, what we heard, what we witnessed is, is the way of our country. I put the word anger in the title of this lecture. I have an entire chapter in the book that I call the, the power of anger. And I'm angry right now. And if you're not angry, as they say, you're not paying attention. There's enough to be angry about. So injustice perpetuates cycles of pain, destruction, and powerful people will often ignore that damage and pain that's performed on minoritized people. So hence the move by some legislators that we're seeing now to tailor public school curricula to downplay American history so that some white people won't be embarrassed or feel badly. And in the process of disregarding us, they prop up these false ideas about critical race theory or this so-called replacement theory giving rise to 18-year-olds who get automatic weapons and body armor and go hunting for my people. So yeah, I'm angry. White people have the power to dismiss my concerns, and I've had Christians cancel people of color that they perceive as angry. This is what's happening right now to Dr. Jamar Tisby. Christian colleges are canceling him because he tells the truth about history and is also angry about injustice. The same is happening to Dr. Kristen Dumay. I don't get targeted like them because I'm not famous. But on a smaller scale, in local churches and denominational gatherings, I have taken the hits uh, well before social media existed. And if I'm perceived as angry, if I don't say it the way white people want to hear it, then it's easy to ignore my voice. So Christians have been taught that anger is wrong, and I want to point out just a couple of places in the Bible to uh, help us um, understand anger. So I'm going to put to some, uh, point to some places where Jesus gets angry, and I submit that getting angry like Jesus is a good thing because it motivates us to dismantle injustice. Both examples are here in Mark's Gospel, and you Bible scholars know how straightforward Mark's Gospel is, keeps the action going on this busy, passionate Savior focused on a mission to, to uh, not to be served, but to serve and give life, his life as a ransom for many. So the first passage is Mark 3, and I didn't know what my font would look like when I got here, so I'm going to read from here, Mark 3, 1 through 6. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. That's Jesus. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Contrasting anger, isn't it? <laughs> Some of the religious people then, just like today, more concerned with their perception of law and order than they were about the man with the withered hand. So we have Christians today who see prisoners, but not the injustice of the penal system. These Christians see impoverished people, but not the inequities of society. These law and order Christians see education gaps, but don't see the discriminatory systems that create inequity in schools and neighborhoods in general. Jesus put the man with the withered hand at the center. He was more concerned about the man's vulnerable situation than he was about the, which day of the week it happened to be. Jesus was angry because some of the religious onlookers were more concerned about Sabbath laws than about human wholeness. We have a program at my school, North Park Theological Seminary. Uh, we call it the School of Restorative Arts. You can get a master's in Christian ministry uh, at the School of Restorative Arts restorative arts, and it's in a Stateville prison. And what's different about this program is that outside students, meaning our maybe on-campus students, can take the classes uh, also with inside students. Of course, the pandemic complicated uh, that, but we just graduated our first class on May 14th. Um, yeah, it was, it's pretty amazing. 
And these brothers are teaching us an awful lot about justice and about systems. And uh, I could go on and on about just that program. They're actually going to have their own graduation program inside um, in a few weeks. But we have people who are more concerned that they about them doing time than about who they are. Jesus is angry. Now, the response by, the, by some religious leaders is also one of anger. We'll make this contrast in a, in a couple of minutes. But notice how destructive their anger is and how constructive Jesus' anger is. So we'll look at Mark chapter 10 also by way of example. This is uh, verses 13 through 16. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them, but when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me, do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. There's so much I could say, so I shouldn't be like making my side little comments here, but I wish I could have seen that. I, I, uh, in my denomination, when you get ordained, one of the last questions they ask you is, are people safe around you? And I, I love that they ask. They ask everybody that I found out, because I thought, why are they asking me that? And I realized they ask everybody that. But one of the things I, that people like for me is maybe I just give off this daddy persona, so little kids like to be around me. I, I thought I would scare them, but, th but I have a good time around them, so I'm liking, I would love to have seen this, Jesus picking up children and blessing them, right? But notice that he's indignant when they try to stop this. Jesus gets angry. So children who held no status in ancient society become the focus for Jesus. The children, in fact, become the heroes of the story, or at least the central characters of the story, because Jesus says that the kingdom of God belongs to those who are like these children. And many times when we talk about that passage, I've heard people say that, well, okay, what is it about the children, that they're trusting, they're teachable? But that's not really the point. It's, it's that they are vulnerable. They possess no status. That's who the kingdom of God is for. Not the rich who think they can buy their way in or the privileged who think that God owes them participation in the kingdom. The kingdom of God belongs to those who have been pushed to the side. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So when I talk about the anger of marginalized people, some defenders of the status quo point to riots and then uh, and even peaceful demonstrations that they fear might get out of hand. I remember when the Million Man March was happening, I was living in D.C. I was doing my doctoral studies back in the 90s and I would ride my bike up to Catholic University up a big hill. So coming home was kind of fun because that hill, I would be flying down the hill just hoping that the light would stay green. And, um, but as I was riding back from class one day, it was the day of the march, and I had a class early, and I was riding thinking, do I want to go there or not? But before I finished that story, the day before at church, there was a woman who was all worked up about all these black men, there was a white woman, all these black men going to be in Washington, D.C., and I'm like, what, what's, your, what's your problem? She was afraid that all of us together was somehow going to be dangerous, and I... It was, it was uh, too much for me not to, um, well, anyway, I had a hard time with her, you might say. <laughs> and that was, that's just one story of many, but I won't, I won't share all those stories right now. But anyway, as I was riding my bike, though, I had to stop at a light, and a guy on his bike came up right next to me, and he said, I saw you way back on such and such. You're going down to the mall, right? I said, yes, I am. So we rode down together. We, like, became these instant, instant friends, and we made it down to the mall and had this a, a very interesting and at times amazing experience. But my point is that when we are trying to um, assemble and we are angry, the defenders of the status quo, they get nervous. And we're not gathering with assault weapons and engaging in a standoff with federal officers like some white people have been allowed to do who don't get shot and killed. White anger is privileged in our society. Black anger demonized. So my point right now is to say that the anger of marginalized people often mirrors the anger of Jesus. That's why we should be paying attention. 
We're not angry because we're inconvenienced. We get angry because of injustice. Our lives are at stake. So being angry over your hurt feelings is not what I'm talking about, or losing your power, which is, I think, back in that Mark 3 story. The, the, these, these religious leaders are, are, are concerned about the loss of their status. That anger is different. <laughs> that anger is destructive. They wanted to destroy Jesus. I'm talking about anger over injustice and marginalization, and that anger is not only justifiable, it's motivational. It ought to lead to change. That's part of what happened in the civil rights movement. Anger motivated action is part of what happened in the anti-apartheid movement. That's part of what happens with women in their ongoing fight for equal rights. We could keep on going on anger, but the point I just want to make right now is that anger is not only justifiable, it is a legitimate motivator for addressing and dismantling injustice. But we're going to move on to another topic, and that's love. So back in 2017, the PBS program Frontline aired an episode called Poverty, Politics, and Profit. And at one point, they discussed Section 8 housing, and they interviewed a white woman who did not want people with Section 8 vouchers in her neighborhood. So this is from the PBS transcript. It starts with a quote from this woman. Her name is Ms. Humphrey. So I'm going to read from the transcript. In this neighborhood, most of us are stay-at-home moms with young kids, she says. The lifestyle that goes with Section 8 is usually working single moms or people who are struggling to keep their heads above water. I feel so bad saying that, she says. It's just not people who are the same class as us. When asked if others who did not have the same opportunity as her could live in her neighborhood, she says, well, the problem with that is I hear a lot of the unfair of, oh, we haven't been given this or that, or we haven't been afforded things you have been afforded. I don't look at multimillionaires and think, why don't I have a yacht? <laughs> yeah. Humphrey says the issue for her is not about race. She says her neighborhood, with rows of tidy new houses and with well-cut lawns, is diverse. The real concern, she says, is that the voucher holders won't fit in, or they won't understand her life. Maybe you saw the clip of the interview. I actually made it around on social media not too long ago. When I saw it, I couldn't help but think, you know, given that kind of neighborhood and her persona, she probably goes to church somewhere. <laughs> and there are plenty of people with Section 8 vouchers who have faith in Jesus who also go to church. But the tendency of some American Christians is to find, you know, a loophole for this woman to excuse her, at least soften the reality of what she's saying. I mean, in the New Testament, in the book of 1 John, it will say, whoever says I'm in the light while hating a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Now, I don't know if she's a Christian or not, and that's really not my main point. But I do know people who are, who would share the same views as she does, who would say they love me, just don't live next to me. So oftentimes, marginalized people, the ones best able to discern and speak prophetically to injustice, or then asked to address problems that have persisted for generations and then not have that experience take a toll on us. Now, I am, I'm getting to love, but I want you to see that context. So I'm standing here talking on a night about race, and I'm so excited that you, are, have, that you have these conversations every year, and, and more than once a year. But when I do these kinds of things, I stand here and can't help but to think of the many Christian contexts that I've been in over the years. And I often said yes to invitations because I was a young pastor with a lot of children and, uh, well, for a relative lot, and, um, and needed resources. <laughs> so I often said yes. But I also believed that what I was doing, I was naive enough to believe that it was going to be helpful. So I would go to these churches, camps, clergy meetings, classrooms, and I've had people who then would minimize me, demonize me, otherwise dismiss me when I speak of racial injustice. And I remember those things frequently. Sometimes the feelings can, can trigger emotional and physical reaction. So uh, to want to withdraw, to close my mouth, to disappear. And that's a sort of a PTSD. And yet when some people of color do get to talking about issues of race and they are able to do this um, and they come to the close of their message, there is always this inevitable question from white people, well, what should we do? Now, this is interesting because marginalized people have faced the injustice, diagnosed the injustice, prophetically spoken against the injustice, then are asked to solve it as well. 
So when we come and have to talk about love, people of color are often expected to ease white Christians' tensions. We are put in this weird position of having to subdue our anger and frustration in order to put white people at ease. And we often will enter those spaces, but we need to still protect ourselves, but we don't want to deliberately make enemies. So you're seeing the tension, I think. So when we're pressured to solve the problems that white Christians created, we can feel as if our only role in life then becomes to serve white people and make them be more whole and holy. Now, I do have African-American friends who take on this task. And I, as I said, I tried when I was younger. 30 years later, as we deal with the same questions, I'm trying to focus my energies a bit differently. So as I talk about love, it won't be maybe what you expect. Because over the years, talks about love, you know, from marginalized Christians, we get this term reconciliation. We're, we're supposed to talk about programs for proximity and not patterns of power. So the solutions for racism were white pastors hiring African-American worship leaders or holding potluck dinners or having pulpit exchanges. I mean, these are nice, basic, good things. I don't want to disparage anything that has the potential of getting people together from different backgrounds, provided there's no pandemic. But those programs for proximity fail to address the underlying issue that I wrote the book about, and that issue is one of power. Who listens to whom? Who submits to whom? Who learns from whom? Who gets to exercise authority? I mean, there's a lot of questions. Love is, of course, the answer. And my message about love, however, is not the holding hands, singing kumbaya stuff. I mean, back in my younger days when I would hear these messages and sometimes even contributed to messages on racial reconciliation, somebody would end with, you know, one of the kind of corny, popular, pop kind of Christian songs at the time. Maybe I shouldn't say corny because I'm sure somebody was really earnest when they did it. But we would sing this song. You're my brother, you're my sister. So take me by the hand, together we will work until he comes. There's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stand. This nice little Russ Taft song. It's nice. There's a good sentiment there. But that's not solving the problem. Oh, yeah, if it was that easy, we'd all sing song, have dinner, and we'd be done. No. We need a whole new mindset. So the thing about love is, is that we need to feel secure in God's love. And I say this often, especially in the book, to people who have been marginalized. It's the notion of what it means to feel secure in God's love. I got a lot of stories personally, but I won't get into all of them. I will say this. Along my journey, I needed to know that God loved me because early on, the church didn't help me to understand that God loved me. It felt in the church of my childhood that God was waiting for me to get my act together and that God was always angry with me. The theological world around me didn't always treat me as if God loved me. I can tell you stories of just even how professors uh, minimized, marginalized me, talked, oh my goodness. Some of them are not alive anymore, so maybe I um, might not be fair to talk about them. But I, but I confronted them then when I was in seminary. I met this one professor. He talked in a class on ethics. We, we were on quarters. We only had 10-week sessions, 10, 10, 10. He talked about abortion for about six weeks. And, uh, and we had to read his book that he had dedicated to the two men who had done most to restore America to its what it's supposed to be, Ronald Reagan and Jesse Helms. This, yeah, yeah, I'm telling you. So, so you know, African-American me in class who's raising my hand, uh, you know, maybe there's two of us in the classroom. I'm like scared. But I asked him at one point, I said, will we ever talk about racism? Because we're about on our sixth week on abortion. And he actually won faculty member of the year award that year because students thought he was doing all this great work for the unborn. Yet he couldn't deal with me who had been born for, for several years at that point. So I'm dealing with this. So the theological world didn't treat me as if God loved me. 
So we need to be confident, secure in God's love. If we are to battle injustice, white people need to feel God's love. But God loves white people because they're made in his image, not because they're inherently more godlike or more worthy. Marginalized people need to feel secure in God's love because society challenges our worth on a daily basis, often in unexpected ways. So we want to be secure in God's love. We also need to love our neighbors as ourselves. And hopefully, I don't have to tell you know, people at a seminary that, but part of the problem of loving our neighbors is dealing with the way Christianity has viewed people of a color, as I was just talking about. And I speak particularly from an African-American standpoint at this point. The issues go beyond me, though, of course. So sadly, Christianity has contributed to racial self-hatred. So what I mean by racial self-hatred is the difficulty that many people of color have loving themselves. And this is true of people in my generation and maybe even a little older. My friend, uh, Dr. Shaniqua Walker Barnes, she wrote this, when people of color internalize the view that whiteness is superior to all other races, including their own, we call this internalized oppression. See, white people have demonized dark skin for eons. White Europeans' quest to seize power had this horrible effect on the indigenous peoples of Australia, Africa, North America, Central America, South America. People still continually struggle to make sense of the mixed legacy of European imperialism. Colonialism continues to be deconstructed. Philosophy. Science, religion, politics, economics, art, a host of disciplines conspire to elevate white Europeans while demonizing dark-skinned people. So you can see how difficult it is when we talk about love, we'll just get it together. There's been a whole system to say that I'm unlovable. We could talk about the whole curse of Ham thing from Genesis. That was the most popular myth promulgated for the purposes, this is some authors, a couple of authors, um, Sadler and um, and Powery, talk about how that myth, you know what I'm talking about in Genesis 9, the so-called curse of Ham. I don't have time to go to the passage right now. But that biblical uh, story turned into a way of justifying slavery. It was so popular in the 19th century. But the sad thing is that it continued past the 19th century. I even grew up in a church that promulgated this so-called curse of ham, right? So the contemporary phrase, Black Lives Matter, is offered as fuel for our self-love. It's an anti-brutality slogan, but it serves to remind us of our inherent worth as human beings. My younger days, we heard James Brown say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud, and how hard that was for some white people to hear. We needed to say black is beautiful to ourselves, to each other. Some white people get agitated with these affirmations of self-love. All lives matter. But when your people have been beaten down, you need to find the affirmation. So we looked for it visual art, TV, movies, and we began to create it even more. Unfortunately, many African Americans have left the Christian church because they didn't find the affirmation and love there. If we are to love neighbors as ourselves, we need to love ourselves, of course. And self-love is not based on a fictional notion of superiority or a socially constructed system of dominance. Love also needs to be honest. As Paul says in that famous 1 Corinthians 13 passage, it does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. When the Apostle Paul says that love rejoices in the truth, this means that love, of course, should be honest. It faces the reality of what God says. Theologian Miroslav Volf, who writes of the moral obligation to remember truthfully in the quest for justice and the movement toward unity, he says this. So the obligation to truthfulness in remembering is at its root an obligation to do justice, even in such a seemingly simple act as the naming of what one person has done to another. Naming. Naming seems simple, but it's hard for many, especially in the dominant culture. And it's sad, it's scary. When historians and others mention racism, they get viewed as the enemy. We should know that the USA was built on the genocide of Native Americans, the dehumanization of Africans, the exploitation of Asians. I sometimes point to this a famous picture where East meets West on the railroad. This is uh, from uh, Russell. This, um, it's hard to see here. But you don't see any Asian people in that picture. And the railroad was built 
with Chinese labor. There's no question that racism is woven into the fabric of America. The sad and scary point is that white dominant society wants to ignore these realities instead of the truth telling, because truth sets us free, powerful people often prefer that we not know or acknowledge the evil parts of this history. Well, my last point is that of power. I've shown you the cover of that Christianity Today magazine because it says the gospel in black and white. This is back in the 80s. That's the church actually I attended when I was in seminaries on the west side of Chicago. It was getting pop, getting well, um, getting a lot of attention because black people and white people worshiping together. My wife is in that choir picture somewhere. I was actually there with my saxophone off to the other side. The guy in the red playing drums, we were seminary students together. We would often ride to church together, but I got cut out. You don't see me in my saxophone, but that's okay. <laughs> After this time, where I had spent time in this church, I went back to New York City, to, to Brooklyn, and we started a new church called New Community, a multi-ethnic church that turned out to be a bit ahead of its time and also unable to raise money. <laughs> and the story of that experience could be a book of its own. But I moved to Washington, D.C. with my wife and four children. We started this new adventure. I got hired by a church on Capitol Hill, actually that was founded by Mennonites. And it was there I learned some hard lessons about how difficult it is for many white Christians to have a non-white pastor. I was an associate at first, and when it came time, when the, when the lead pastor left, there was a strong push for me to be the lead pastor, and I was happy to try and, and, and lean into that. But uh, there was a core of people who really, really made it clear they did not want a black pastor. I stayed for a while and learned an awful lot of lessons there. Some of them I talk about in the, in the book. The church thought of itself as inclusive, but it behaved in ways in Washington, D.C. that marginalized a significant segment of Chocolate City. Now, I'm not a sociologist, as I said. I'm a pastor, I'm a student of scripture, but I want to consider my experiences as well as the exegesis of Bible passages and, and, and just to end with a few thoughts about power. Sadly, you know, a lot of white people in the USA and Europe expect to be at the center of everything. But their power, gained often through coercion and exploitation, is not the sort of power that I'm talking about. I often show this, um, talk about this scene that I liked in, um, in Black Panther. So and some of you might chuckle because you may guess why I like the scene so much. So when King T'Challa is incapacitated, and he's brought to um, Mbaku and the Jabari tribe to get some help. His mother, the queen, is there, and a few others are there, right? His sister. Um, and Agent Ross is there, the white CIA agent, who starts to explain everything. And Mbaku bangs his staff and starts to bark. I don't know if any of you remember, if you saw the movie. And then the whole Jabari tribe starts to bark, and they drown out Agent Ross. I was standing up. I was like, yes, I said, I don't know. And we went as a staff team from my church, and we all went, and I was like, but I actually went back to the movie. I had to see it again. And, um, but I said to myself, oh, my goodness, I am so grateful for that scene. I said, because so much of my life, I've had this, you know, this white mansplaining thing. I know you women have to deal with us, with the whole mansplaining, but white mansplaining, oh, my goodness. It's like, anyway, insert themselves into the story even when it's not about you. So when I wrote the book, I said oftentimes when, I, you know, when my friends write these books, they're writing them to get white people to do better. And I said, you know, I really want to write in a way that says, if we can have a solidarity of the marginalized, we can actually show something that's better. And we maybe can pull some folks along rather than put them at the center of, of the story all the time. Time is, is getting away from me. I did practice one time, but I've been talking a lot, stuff that I didn't write down. But I'll make a couple of comments <laughs> along the way. One is that it, th this point about power is to say that spiritual power comes from folks who understand what it means to not be at the center. And see, what we tend to think is that people have to give us power. So we will talk about white people empowering us. And what I say in the book is that, no, we already have a power. So I don't even use that term anymore. I'm talking about empowering. It's like if, if there's a male pastor and you know, women uh, who are coming up in ministry in the church, they talk about empowering to do ministry. No, they already have the power. 
What they need is the opportunity, right? So I'm not empowering anybody. So you're not empowering us when white people, they may give us opportunity. But that power is a power that's born from, from the spirit of God and from our circumstances. So in a lot of contexts, you know, the Christian faith of European folks is the standard. So you take theology, but then you take black theology. Or you take theology, and then you have to have the adjective in front for something that's not white, right? Faith of marginalized people then is respected only to the degree to which it affirms white superiority. But what's the picture of Christianity that's most like that of Christ? Just a couple of observations here. The first is from Albert Rabateau, a professor of religion. He says, African-American Christianity has continuously confronted the nation with troubling questions about American exceptionalism. Perhaps the most troubling was this. If Christ came as the suffering servant, who resembled him more, the master or the slave? Suffering slave Christianity stood as a prophetic condemnation of America's obsession with power, status, and possessions. African-American Christians perceived in American exceptionalism a dangerous tendency to turn the nation into an idol and Christianity into a clan religion. Divine election brings not preeminence, elevation, and glory, but as black Christians know all too well, humiliation, suffering, and rejection. Chosenness, as reflected in the life of Jesus, led to a cross. The lives of his disciples have been signed with that cross. To be chosen in this perspective means joining company, not with the powerful and the rich, but with those who suffer, the outcast, the poor, the despised, which is like that passage that uh, Dr. Blyer read from Luke. So Rabbitoh makes a good point. It's not unlike a point made by uh, Frederick Douglass. This is a quote that you might see many times. <clears throat> he said, what I've said respecting and against religion, I mean strictly to apply to the slaveholding religion of this land and with no possible reference to Christianity proper. For between the Christianity of this land and the Christianity of Christ, I recognize the widest possible difference. So wide that to receive the one as good, pure, and holy is of necessity to reject the other as bad, corrupt, and wicked. To be the friend of the one is of necessity to be the enemy of the other. I love the pure, peaceable, and impartial Christianity of Christ. I therefore hate the corrupt, slave-holding, women-whipping, cradle-plundering, partial and hypocritical Christianity of this land. Oh, yeah. Douglas could see that the Christianity practiced by so many in America was not the way of Jesus in the scriptures. Yet, I dare say that for many today, and maybe in certain pockets of Christianity, the great American heroes of the faith are those who justified slavery, who owned people, who weren't always sure what to make of the souls of black folks. Some of the theological giants weren't even sure if we could be saved. So my thoughts about the power of marginalized people comes in part from my study of 1 Peter, and that's where my shameless plug, I did write a commentary on 1 Peter, but I wrote <clears throat> after thinking, I wrote my from the margins after thinking in 1 Peter how he talks about people who are in the diaspora, Christians who are marginalized. And theologian Willie Jennings, he poignantly describes what diaspora can mean with regard to imperial rule. Now, it's a long quote, but oh my goodness, he's such a poet. It was hard to know where to break this quote, but I'm going to read some of it. I, I, I know he's spoken here, and uh, just a tremendous communicator. I'll read some of this about diaspora. Diaspora means scattering and fragmentation, exile and loss. It means being displaced and in search of a place that could be made home. Danger and threats surround diaspora life. Diaspora life is crowded with self-questioning and questions for God concerning the anger, hatred, and violence visited upon a people. We must never confuse voluntary migration with diaspora because diaspora is a geographic and social world not chosen in a psychic state inescapable. The peoples who inhabit diaspora <clears throat> excuse me, live with animus and violence filling the air they breathe. They live always on the verge of being classified enemy, always in evaluation of their productivity to the empire, always having an acceptance on loan, ready to be taken away at the first sign of sedition. They live with fear as an ever-present partner in their lives, the fear of being turned into a them, a dangerous other, 
those people among us. He got more to say about it. He says, they, they, they also remember loss of land, of place, of life and hope, and even for some of faith yet. Diaspora is also power, the power of a conviction to survive and the power of a confession to never yield to the forces that would destroy them. Diaspora is life by any means necessary. That was beautiful. The last line I'll read, he says, faith is always caught between diaspora and empire. And he breaks that down a bit. I can make the, certainly make the slides available. But the point is that diaspora signifies shame people who have little status, those who are vulnerable. I mean, black people here are part of a diaspora. And then when we read, even in Christian material, I remember this as a young guy seeing you know, Christianity Today, I thought, oh, I'm supposed to read that magazine because other pastors are reading it. So I would get it, and there would be these ads for you to find your family crest. I was like, first I laughed, and then I got mad. I got this name Edwards, I don't even know how I got the name Edward. And, and the thing I got mad about isn't just that that service was available, but they knew to market it here. They knew who their audience was. It wasn't me. Those who, because of race, ethnicity, language, sex, gender, physical appearance, or capability, income, a host of other reasons are pushed to the side, yet in their vulnerability, in their pain, and even shame, they show us the way of Jesus. Suffering is characteristic diaspora life, but diaspora Christians, alienated Christians, they give us a picture of Jesus that's more accurate than the blonde, blue-eyed European Jesus whose picture hangs in so many churches. Diaspora Christians show us a Jesus who suffered but not for nothing. Jesus who suffered, did not retaliate, serves as this ultimate example. During the heat of oppression, we show ourselves to be like Jesus. Because my mother died at a relatively young age, her young age, and all of us youngsters at home, um, really young, my main link came to her and the rest of her family. She was an only child. Uh, through my great aunt, Flossie. So I, came I became close to Aunt Flossie during my years, uh, uh, nearly 18 years in Washington, D.C., the city where on a streetcar in 1946 or so, she met Clifton Johnson, her husband of 65 years. So sometime during the Great Migration, Aunt Flossie moved from rural South Carolina with one of her older sisters, Josie, my grandmother, and Josie's daughter, Loetta, my mother. I never learned the circumstances behind these women's trek north. They would never talk about it. But the decision to leave home is never easy. If you haven't already, read that book, The Warmth of Other Sons by Isabel Wilkerson. It is powerful. Anyway, it's about the great migration. But, 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 but what I want to get at is after the movie uh, The Help came out, Aunt Flossie and I were talking, and she, she, she said, you know, I don't have any desire to see that movie, Dennis. She said, her, grand, her grandkids, which you know, distant cousins to me, were trying to get her to go see it. And she said, Dennis, this is a quote, don't you know all the females in your family did domestic work for white people? She's like, why do I need to see that? <laughs> So all the females, that would include my mother, my grandmother, her sisters, they were, they were two of 11 siblings, my grandmother. Now, I never can know or fully appreciate the mess that these women had to face. Verbal abuse they took, segregation they endured, the humili humiliation of having to clean up other people's mess, the thankless task of cooking other people's meals while caring for other people's children, and on top of that, having to cook, clean, and care for their own families? I mean, a burden these women carried for years. And there's so many of us who could, who could say that with all the injustices that these women and men had to endure, there's also this legacy of great faith. This is the remarkable thing. So when she passed away, I helped to um, participate in the funeral service. The eulogist was a retired federal judge. A few African-Americans had had that role, and he was a fellow member of her church. When he was born, she was the first person besides his mother to carry him. 
He grew up across the street from my Aunt Flossie, so he started telling stories to the family that I asked him, could he please give me a writing, and he never did. He said, I'm going to tell you things that some of you don't even know. And he proceeded to tell us about the days of her picking cotton in South Carolina. But then he went on to talk about her virtuous character. And just, he just said very simply, she lived the golden rule. Everybody there not in an agreement. Everybody present knew how true this was. So here Aunt Flossie had lived a humble life in arguably the most powerful and arrogant city in the world, Washington, D.C. Could see the capital in the distance demonstrating a faith more tenacious, love more generous than many professing Christians with power and status in that same city. What I'm trying to say is, you'd be better off being in the living room with Aunt Flossie baking you a pound cake than trying to get into the Oval Office and impress the president. Because that's where real faith is being forged. Christians have been taught that only the financially or politically powerful in society have the ability to teach anything of substance. But the lessons from the marginalized are not just for other marginalized people, although that's where I start. What scripture and experience demonstrate is that oppressed and marginalized people are our most powerful teachers of what it means to follow Christ. If we would only listen and follow, diaspora Christians are not merely inspirational they are educational, they are our teachers. And the church does well to follow the lead of those on the margins because that's where we see Christ most clearly. Well, I'll just end with that. My summary, get angry over injustice, but get angry and do something. Love God, love your neighbor, and love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> Uh, honor those on the margins by following their spirit-empowered leadership. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.